Hello, my name is Natasha Pence. I am an independent piano teacher in the greater Cincinnati, Northern Kentucky area. I serve as president of Northern Kentucky MTA, as well as the chairperson for membership and certification for KMTA. Today I will introduce Gerald Chafin, who is giving us a session titled Unlocking the Leadership Legacy of Beethoven at 250. Beethoven made quite an impression on those he encountered, and his leadership legacy can teach us about influencing our students even during that one opportunity to make a good first impression. Gerald L. Chafin serves as conductor of choral ensembles as well as the assistant to the president for church relations at Lindsay Wilson College in Columbia, Kentucky. Dr. Chafin's innovation pioneered a multidisciplinary concert approach as well as the extraordinary touring tradition with LWC choral ensembles, having performed in 40 states and seven countries. He has created courses in performance coaching as well as worship and the arts. Dr. Chafin twice received the Exemplary Teaching Award from the General Board of Higher Education and Ministry of the United Methodist Church. As pianist, he studied with Darlene Reed, Wesley Roberts, Robert Bowd, and Maurice Henson. As conductor, he studied with Milburn Price, Douglas Smith, and William Ramsey. As a graduate student at Southern Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky, he was named a Distinguished Rice Judson Scholar. And interestingly, through his teachers and mentors, his musical genealogy traces back to Beethoven himself. Dr. Chafin has participated in over 600 performances with Lindsay Wilson College. Fifty-nine, sixty. Every day, exactly sixty coffee beans, meticulously counted every morning. Oh yes, it's a strange habit I picked up from Beethoven, but nonetheless helps me connect and remember an event that forever changed my life. Remembering can be somewhat regretful. We all have regrets about something, and I can scarcely blame myself, but oh, how I regret not having taken down more extensive notes than I did. It was such a life-changing encounter, but as a lad of 15 years old, I was so self-possessed. It's amazing I gave regard to any details. I was in a large city for the first time, away from my small town home. Yet, it's ironic that after all these years, I have a perfect recall of everything that I'm telling you. The journey was slow because of snow-covered roads from Weimar to Vienna. But ah, Vienna, musical, magical Vienna. It was March, 1827, and my piano and composition instructor, Johann Hummel, had heard the news that his old friend and his musical rival was dying. 
Hummel wanted to introduce me to his friend. Looking back all these years later, I believe Hummel saw something in me. He wanted me to be inspired through even just a few minutes spent in the company of greatness. We were received warmly on the eighth day of March, and we stayed for hours that day. Beethoven was unshaven. His thick, half-gray hair fell in disorder over his temples, and that's how everyone knew him, with all of that hair. I remember he embraced Hummel, and Beethoven was really glad to see him. And then that moment came. Hummel introduced me, and Ludwig von Beethoven showed himself extremely kind. I was invited to sit opposite from him at the window. In order for him to carry on a conversation, Thick sheets of writing paper and lead pencils lay near him at all times. How painful it must have been for this animated, easily impatient man to be obliged to wait for every answer, to make a pause in every moment of conversation. He always followed the hand of the writer with hungry eyes and comprehended what was written at a glance instead of reading it. He asked about my studies and he encouraged me greatly. And despite his reputation for being incredibly demanding and difficult to deal with, he did have an encouraging side to his personality. Amazingly, I am grateful this side of Beethoven was displayed to me and actually to other younger aspiring musicians as well. For example, I learned that in the summer of 1812, during a particularly trying time in Beethoven's life, there was a young girl, only known as Emily, who played the piano she embroidered a pocketbook and sent it to Beethoven as a gift with an admiring note. Although he did not know her, Beethoven sent a letter of reply. My dear, kind Emily, my reply to your letter to me is late in arriving. A great amount of persistent Ill illness may serve to excuse me. The fact that I am here for the recovery of my health proves the truth of my excuse. Your pocketbook will be treasured, but of that I am still far from deserving. I want you to persevere, Emily. Do not only practice your art, but endeavor also to fathom its inner meanings. Your art deserves this effort. If, my dear Emily, you should ever desire to have anything, do not hesitate to write to me. The true artist has no pride. The true artist has a vague awareness of how far he is from reaching the goal, and while others may perhaps admire him, he laments that he has not yet reached the point to which his better genius only lights the way for him like a distant sun. Look upon me as your friend and the friend of your family, Ludwig von Beethoven. Other letters of Beethoven reveal his struggle with deafness. Going back 10 years further to the fall of 1802, Beethoven distanced himself from Vienna to the secluded town of Heilingestadt. This letter, known as the Heilingestadt Testament, was never mailed to his brothers, but thankfully was later discovered in Beethoven's personal papers after he died. Through this writing, Beethoven comes to terms with his deafness. My heart 
and soul have been full of the tender feeling of goodwill, and I was ever inclined to accomplish great things. But to think that for six years now I have been hopelessly afflicted, yet finally compelled to face the prospect of a lasting malady. I was soon compelled to withdraw myself to live alone. If at times I tried to forget all this, oh, how harshly was I flung back by the doubly sad experience of my bad hearing. It was impossible for me to say to people, speak louder, shout, for I am deaf. How could I possibly admit an infirmity in the one sense which ought to be more perfect in me than in others, a sense which I once possessed to the highest perfection, a perfection that few in my profession enjoy or have ever enjoyed? Therefore, forgive me when you see me draw back when I would have gladly mingled with you. My misfortune is doubly painful to me because I'm bound to be misunderstood. I cannot mix with society only as much as truly necessity demands. What a humiliation for me when someone standing next to me heard a flute in the distance and I heard nothing. Or someone heard a shepherd singing again and I heard nothing. Such incidents drove me almost to despair. A little more of that and I would have ended my life. It was only my art that held me back. It seemed to me impossible to leave the world until I had brought forth all that I felt that was within me. So I endured this wretched existence. Patience they say, is what I must now choose for my guide, and I have done so. What resoluteness to say, and I have done so. What extreme determination Beethoven gave to the world. Do you understand the length of time involved in Beethoven's display of this extraordinary resoluteness and determination? I met him as a 15-year-old in 1827. He wrote the Highland Gestalt Testament in 1802, and that letter of 1802 begins with, but to think that for six years now, so from 1796 until 1827, he composed the most progressive, soundscape expanding music that the world has ever known. He was a person of remarkable contrast. Some might even say his contrasts were as night and day. But Psalm 30 verse 5 says, Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Indeed, his dark night of the soul was long to be endured. I think of the piano sonata, often referred to as the Moonlight Sonata, as a parable of Beethoven's life. There is that one note melody that just stays there. Maybe longing to move, but it comes back and tries again. And all that melody is placed above triplet figures in C-sharp minor.
and finally coming to a moment in major, brighter indeed. But of course, that section ends with such a long moment back to C sharp minor. And yet joy comes in the morning. How appropriate to hear during the Passion Week and into Eastertide Beethoven's chorus from the Mount of Olives. <laughs> I'm Gerald Chafin. You've been listening to a sketch of the experiences of Ferdinand Hiller, who met Beethoven in March 1827 as a 15-year-old, and who finally, 45 years later, chronicled his amazing experience. <laughs>